Delighted that you're here this morning. I hope you've got your Bible with you and eager to take that. We're going to be studying from our text. And I encourage you to take your Bible and follow along with us. We have visitors with us. We're glad that you're here and hope you can come back and be with us again in future services. As most who know me well know that I've done more than my share of carpentry work in my lifetime. Not only doing a little framing now and then, but more trim carpentry and cabinet work. But in the last few months, I've been heavily involved in building us a house. Before that, remodeling and rebuilding a house for my sister. And so that's been my focal point for several months is building. So I'm almost sick and tired of building. But I mention that because as a preacher, and really all of us as Christians ought to have this mindset that you constantly see parallels between things in this life and the spiritual. And I see a parallel between building a house and building your spiritual house. There's a great parallel. They're parallel in a number of ways. There's plans for both. There's tools to be used. There's materials that need to be gathered. There's cost that's involved and there's time involved. If you've ever built a house or had a house built, you know all of those are true. And that's especially true when it comes to our spiritual house. So I want to talk about building your spiritual house. Those who know we've been building and that I've been heavily involved constantly ask me, how's the building coming? How far along are you? When will you be done? Let me ask you that question, but I'm asking about your spiritual house. How's your spiritual house coming? How's the construction going? How far along are you? Do you feel like you've reached maturity? Do you feel like you're, you're, you're moving along at a rapid pace? Are you running behind? Is it costing you more than you meant for it to cost you? Are you spending more time than you intended to spend? How's your spiritual house coming? Let's talk about building your spiritual house. Now the Bible uses a physical, literal house to make comparison to spiritual things. You're well aware of this. Let's go to the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter 7. And what Jesus is talking about is obedience here, that those who are in the kingdom are those who need to be obedient, and this is part of the invitation section of responding and coming into the kingdom. And he said, therefore, whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, I liken him to a wise man that built his house on a rock. And he's talking about a literal, physical house to illustrate a spiritual matter. What about a man who builds his house on a rock, a solid foundation? Well, what about that? Well, the rains descend, the floods come, and the winds blow and beat on the house, and it did not fall for it was founded on a rock, built on a solid foundation. In other words, build your house, your physical, literal house on a solid foundation, and it'll stand. Then he goes further and said, everyone who hears these sayings of mine and does not do them is like the foolish man that built his house on the sand. Can you imagine building a house on the sand? On the beach? Well, what happens, verse 27, the rains descend, the floods come, and the winds blow, and they beat on the house, and it fell, and great was the fall of it. The parallel Jesus is drawing is, those who are obedient are building on a solid foundation, those who don't obey are building on sand, and their house is going to fall. He uses a house to illustrate. That's what we're trying to do in our study this morning. Let's go again, Hebrews chapter 3. For the one who has been counted worthy of more glory than Moses, insomuch as he who built the house has more honor than the house. Jesus was superior to Moses. Moses is part of the house. Jesus is the builder of the house. And so he uses a literal house. The one who builds has more glory than the house itself. For every house is built by someone. He who builds all things is God. You look at a building a house and you say, somebody built that. Who built that? You're building a spiritual house. Who built that? Well, you're building it. How is it looking? What's it like? Let's go again. Let's look at Galatians chapter 2. I'm just simply illustrating the Bible uses a literal physical house that you live in as a parallel to make some spiritual application. Galatians 2 and in verse 18, For if I build again those things that I once destroyed, I make myself a transgressor. You know, about building something that has been torn down? Sometimes you tear something down because you don't want it anymore, and then you build it back with the same materials? It's worthless. Romans 15 and verse 20, And so I have made it my aim to preach the gospel, not where Christ is not na- was named, lest I should build on another man's foundation. 
So he's talking about building a house on a foundation to make a spiritual application. So let me ask you the question, what is your spiritual house? You say, I understand there is a spiritual application. I got that. But what do you mean by my spiritual house? What is that? But your spiritual house, we're talking about your relationship to God. How are you building that relationship to your God? We're not only talking about your relationship to God, we're talking about your faith, which is involved in your relationship to God. You build and you maintain your faith. Faith is built like you build a house. Are you building your faith? Are you maintaining your faith? Your house has to be maintained. You don't just neglect it. It'll collapse and fall if you don't maintain it. More about that in a moment. You're talking about your spiritual condition before God. How are you building your spiritual house? What's it look like? How well is it going? I want to tell you there are different kinds of houses. But that I simply mean there are houses that are well built in solid construction. Built by people who know what they're doing. We had an elder where I preached in Louisville that uh, banks would loan money based on the fact he was the builder of the house. When they wouldn't let it out on another reason and people would be walking out the door of the bank. By the way, who's building your house? And they'd name this elder Come back, I think we've got some money for you because if he built it, it's well-built, solid construction, you've got some money for this house. Some houses are well-built, solid construction. On the other hand, there are houses that are poorly built and shoddy construction. There are certain builders, when their name comes up, I tell people to run from them. They'll make a, it's a shoddy house. It will not be built well. You don't want that kind of house. There's another house that was a good house, well built, but poorly maintained. You may have a house, you said, this was built by an excellent contractor and he did a great job, but what have you done since though? Have you maintained it? Have you let termites eat it alive? Did you neglect it? And maybe it's not well maintained. Isaiah is quoted by Stephen in Acts chapter 7 concerning the Bill Solomon building the temple. This was the question being raised in, about the temple. But we make application of that question. And the question is, what house will you build for me, says the Lord? The Lord's asking you that question. What kind of house are you building for me? Well, I tell people, well, we've been involved in building. Well, what are you building? And I tell them, here's what I'm building. Here's how big it is. Here's what we're doing. But the question is, what are you building? What kind of house, God is asking, are you building for me? Are you building a good solid house? Is it a strong house? Or is it shoddy? Have you started building and then you neglected it and it's beginning to fall over because you haven't finished it? What kind of house are you building? So let's talk about building your spiritual house. Let's start with this. If you're going to build your spiritual house, you must have a plan. If you're going to build a house, you must have a plan. And what do we mean by that? Can you imagine starting a house and you have no idea of the size or the style or how it's going to be arranged? Could you imagine coming to my place and you say, well, I've got a mini-ex out there digging a footer. And you say, what are you building? I'm building a house. Well, how big? Well, I don't have an idea how big it's going to be. Well, you're going to have a kitchen? Well, I'm not sure if we're going to have, I'm not sure what we're going to build. We're just going to start building. Don't have a plan. You want to have two bedrooms? Well, I don't know. I just, I have, I'm just, just starting to build, but I don't have a clue what I'm doing yet. Can't imagine building a house. There are some who try to build a spiritual house without a plan. As absurd as that illustration seems, there are people who build the spiritual house the same way. They have no idea what the finished product is supposed to look like. You start to build a house, the builder ought to be able to tell you, here's what it's going to look like. It's going to go up and it's going to have this pitch roof and we're going to have the kitchen over here and the bedrooms over here and et cetera. Here's what it's going to look like. There are people trying to build their spiritual house. They have no idea what the finished product. They have no idea what they already have or what they need. What materials do I already have and what additional things do I need to build my spiritual house? They have no clue about that. Merely go to worship at times and do little more than about their spiritual life. And they're not seeking to build their spiritual house. So let's talk about a plan. What do you want to be? In other words, the builder, if he comes out to build your house, he says, well, what is it you're wanting? Wanting a three-bedroom house, two-bedroom house, you want two stories? What is it you want? What is it that you want with a spiritual house? Well, here's the first thing. You want to be strong and you want to be mature. I cite 2 Peter chapter 1 beginning at verse 5. Add to your faith virtue to virtue, knowledge to knowledge, temperance, temperance, patience, patience, godliness, godly brotherly kindness, and brotherly kindness, charity, or love. 
Here are the building blocks of building a strong, mature Christian. Add to your faith. Increase your faith. Add to what faith you already have and mature in various areas of patience and love and knowledge, endurance. Here is a picture, 2 Peter chapter 1, of a strong and a mature Christian. Not all Christians are strong and mature. So what kind of house are you trying to build? You say, I want to be a spiritually strong and mature Christian. Here's something else about your plan. You want to be knowledgeable of God's Word. Paul would say in Hebrews chapter 5 verse 11, For when the time you ought to be teachers, you have need someone teach you again that which be the first principles. In other words, you should have grown and developed, but you haven't. So you need to have knowledge so you can teach others, but you can't even teach yourself hardly. So what are your goal? What's your plan? Well, I want to plan the building of the spiritual house means I want to be knowledgeable of God's Word so that I can go beyond the first principles and I can take those principles and teach them to somebody else. Here's part of the plan. I want to be a good example. Paul told Timothy, be thou an example of the believer in word and spirit and faith and impurity, etc. That is, you be the kind of person that people could point to and say, that's what a Christian is like. Let's go to Titus chapter 2. Paul said essentially the same thing in Titus chapter 2 as uh, was said to Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter 4. But look at Titus chapter 2, if you will, and in verse 10 it says, Not pilfering, but showing good fidelity, that they may adorn the doctrine of God, our Savior in all things. What's his point? His point is when you set a good example, you're shining and adorning. You're polishing the doctrine of God so that it becomes attractive to people. See, people may not be attracted to the gospel until they see it shining through you. That's the idea of Titus chapter 2. I want to be a good example. That's part of the plan. I want to be more acceptable unto God. Paul said, this is my aim, whether present or absent, to be accepted of Him. I want God to be pleased with my life. And in fact, 2 Peter 3, 18, growing the grace and in the knowledge means I'm growing more acceptable unto God. I grow more pleasing and acceptable in His sight. But may I suggest, in building you need to be realistic. Someone who has no idea about building could call the contractor and say, I want to build. Well, what do you want to build? I want to build a 10,000 square foot house. I'm going to tell you, you probably can't afford that. (laughs) That's a big house. Be realistic. That is in my goal. You say, I want to master and know all the Bible, everything there is. Well, that may be a little unrealistic to know everything there is to know, but you can have greater knowledge. That's more realistic, isn't it? I want to be the strongest Christian. Well, just be strong. Not try to be better than everybody else. Be realistic in your goals. And furthermore, be flexible. Be willing to make changes where you can improve. person who's rigid in their plan on their house is not going to go too well with the contract. You've got to be flexible a little bit. I want to make some changes. He may want to make some changes a little bit. And you need to make some changes with your plan that may make some improvement. Where you may need to improve where you didn't think you needed to improve. We need to have a plan. Now let's begin with a vision of what an ideal Christian would be. Let's go to Colossians chapter 1. Paul wrote to the church at Colossae in Colossians 1. And this is his prayer for them, by the way. Colossians 1, beginning at verse 9 through 12. This is what he was praying for them. And I want you to focus on three things. He was praying, this was the ideal Christian. This is what I want for you. This is my goal for you. This is my plan for you. This is God's plan for you. What does he say? For this reason... We also, since the day we heard it, did not cease to pray for you. What's your prayer for him, Paul? To ask that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will and all wisdom and spiritual understanding. Here's a picture of an ideal Christian being filled with knowledge. Where they know the book of God, they've consumed the book of God, and they have not only knowledge, but they have wisdom and spiritual understanding. But that's not all he prayed about. Look at verse 11. That you may walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing Him. That is, you may walk fully wo- uh, pleasing Him, walking worthy of the Lord, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. So here's one who is walking worthy. They're walking in harmony with the will of God. Not only do they have knowledge, but they're implementing that knowledge in their life. But he's not through. He's not through. Notice it, verse 11, strengthened with all might according to his glorious power with all patience and long suffering with joy, giving thanks to the Father. You see, the picture of the ideal Christian is being filled with knowledge, living it out in their life, and they're strong so that they can resist the temptations along the way. What kind of plan do you have for your spiritual? Do you have a plan? Have you got something laid out? This is what I'm trying to come. This is where I'm going. 
Secondly, if you're going to build a house, you must know how to build. If you're going to build a house, you say, I'm going to build a house. And by the way, the spiritual house, you're building yourself. You can't hire somebody else to build that for you. You're going to do it yourself. You need to know how to build. If you're going to build a physical house, you need to know how to build. Here's some things we must know. I can't imagine trying to build a house and have no clue how to frame. Say, I'm going to build my own house. Do you know how to frame? No, I don't know how to frame. I don't know what kind of lumber you, I don't know how, how far apart you space them. Can't imagine building a house and you don't know how to hang a door and you don't know how to wire the house. Don't have a clue. See, you need to know what, what you're doing. You need to know some things. We need to know the order of things. For example, in building a house, do you hang the wall board? You say, well, yeah, I'm ready to put sheetrock up. We had not even insulated yet. Get the wrong order. So you need to know how to build if you're going to build your house. Some attempt to build faith when they have no idea of some things. They have no idea how to build faith. They want to have stronger faith, but that's like building a house when you don't know what you're doing. You're trying to build faith, but we don't know how to build our faith. Some try to build their faith, and they, they don't know how to make the house, the spiritual house, strong. I want a strong house, but they don't have a clue how to make their house strong. But they're wanting to make a strong house. They don't know what should come first. Sometimes what comes next is what they're already looking at when they haven't got the previous thing done. Like maybe getting the insulation in, as we mentioned a moment ago. So here's some things we must know how to do. We must know how to build. We build with the Word of God in the spiritual house. Let's go to Acts chapter 20 and verse 32. Paul said to the church, or to the elders of the church at Ephesus, I commend you to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up. See, there's that building up, making stronger. We build with the word of God. That's how we do that. We build with the word. You want your faith to be stronger, you're going to have to make an appeal to the word of God. Say, I want to be stronger, but I'm doing things away from the word, spending little time with the word. Don't expect your faith to get any stronger. Let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 14. I want you to see this point. This is an excellent point Paul drives home that we need to understand. In 1 Corinthians chapter 14, <clears throat> the context is very important. There was a misunderstanding that spiritual gifts, particularly the tongues, was the most exalted gift. Everybody wants to be able to speak in tongues. And so one might speak in tongues but have no interpretation. And if that be the case, there is no edification that comes from that. So let's begin at verse 1. Let's begin at verse, verse 1. Actually, let's drop down to verse 3. But he who prophesies speaks edification and exhortation and comfort to men. See, the one who spoke in tongues, verse 2, had just told us. We skipped that. There is no receiving of edification unless there be an interpretation. But the one who prophesies, that's the revealing of the word, there is edification. But he, verse 4, who speaks in a tongue edifies himself, but he who prophesies edifies the church. Let's go to verse 5. I wish that all spoke in tongues, but even more than all prophesied. For he who prophesies is greater than he who speaks in tongues, unless indeed he interprets that the church may receive edification. What's his point? There may be excitement of the tongues, but you didn't gain nothing unless there be some revelation from God. With prophecy, there's revelation from God. And when there's revelation from God, that's when you grow and you're edified, you're built up. Here's the point we're making. We're built by the Word of God, not by enthusiasm and excitement. See, we may be in a church service and get all excited, and we may be enthused. That doesn't make you grow. The Word of God makes you grow. We don't grow by mere association and by mere of fun that we have. We get together with others and we're having fun. You say, I'm really growing. No, you're not growing. You're not growing unless you're spending some time with the Word. That's where strength and edification comes. That's why I say we don't, sometimes don't know how to build. Here's a guy building a house and he doesn't know whether to use plywood or he doesn't know whether to use one bys or two. He doesn't know how to frame. doesn't have a clue. But he's going to build his house. Some are building their spiritual house the same way. I'm going to spend time having fun and with excitement, and I think I'm building my spiritual house, and I'm not building at all. I'm not building at all. Here's something else. There needs to be regular systematic study. Like the Bereans who searched the Scriptures daily, and then verse 12 said they believed. They had faith because they had some systematic regular study. 
There was the reading of the law of Moses every Sabbath, Acts 15, 21. That was a regular, systematic study. And what we mean by that, not just some random study where I open my Bible up to a text here and I read a little bit and then I open up over here and I read a little bit. I have no clue of the context of either of those texts. I'm not growing, I'm not studying, I'm not building. Not the kind of hit and miss of Bible classes and sermon. I got this class and then I missed about three classes and then I'm trying to study maybe the book of Revelation with them and I got chapter one and then I got chapter four and I got chapter seven and we have no clue what Revelation is about because we've missed a good bit. Regular systematic study. Here's something else we, we need. That is we need to grasp the basics before the deeper Oh, we're fascinated with the deeper things, and I, I want to dig in, and I want to find out about the deeper things when I don't even have the basics yet. That's like saying, I'm wanting to paint. You ain't even got wallboard up yet. What are you going to paint? Well, let's put a wallboard up. You don't have insulation yet. We want some of the deeper things, but we don't have the basics down yet. Hebrews chapter 5, you have need that one teach you again the first principles. You need to get those first. Times we... There's some things we need to know before we can teach and help other people. Like James 3, verse 1, be not many teachers. What's the point? I need to grasp and understand before I can help somebody else understand. There's some things I may not be ready for just yet. We've all run into this. Maybe you've helped somebody obey the gospel and they're young in the faith and they're wanting to get a grasp of some deeper concept when they don't have the basics yet and you, you try to gently tell them, you're not ready for that yet. You're not ready to study that yet until you get the basics down first. We've got to get some principles down first. Let's work on that. But let's go to Hebrews chapter 2, verse 1. I need to know how to prevent problems and how to handle problems. Hebrews 2, 1, what does it tell me? Give the more earnest heed to the things that you've heard, lest at any time we should drift away. I need to pay close attention to the word and give heed to the word or I'm going to drift away from the word. Like the basics, the first principles. If I, if I let up on the first principles and back away from those, I'm going to forget those. And there's going to be apostasy. How do I handle problems? We have a high priest to go to in time of need. And so I need to know how to build if I'm going to build a house. If you're building a house, you need to have a plan. You need to know how to build, but number three, you need to must have the right foundation. If you're going to build, you've got to have the right foundation. A good foundation is important. Foundation is extremely important. That's what Matthew 7, we've already, we won't go back there. That's the, the, uh, the wise man and the foolish man, building on the rock or building on the sand. The foundation is very important. You know that. The foundation is something we don't see once the house is finished, and that's not the track. Maybe we're thinking, I, I'm, I'm focusing on color. Or I'm focusing on the chandelier. Or I'm focusing on the wallpaper. Or I'm focusing on how we're going to decorate. When that's not as important as the foundation. The foundation is so important. It's extremely important. Because the whole house rests on that foundation. If the foundation is weak, the rest of the house is in danger. If the foundation is strong, the house is solid. Let's go to Hebrews chapter 6 beginning at verse 1. The foundation of the first principles has to be well laid. Not laying again the foundation. Let's go to Hebrews chapter 6. Remember, this is in the context. If you've forgotten the context, let me remind you. This is in the context of some who had forgotten the first principles and need to be taught again. And then he said, leaving the discussion of the elementary principles, let us go on into perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of doctrine of baptism, laying on of hands, resurrection from the dead. In other words, he lists a number of basic principles. That these are the foundation, and then you build on that foundation. Foundation is important. Let's talk about some first principles that we need to know. Like inspiration. Got to build on the right foundation. If we don't have a concept of the inspiration of the scriptures, nothing else is going to be important. 2 Timothy 3.16 said, all scripture is given by the breath of God. All scripture is given by God's breath, and it is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, and instruction, and righteousness. If we don't have a concept that every word given by God, every word that we read is given by the breath of God, then nothing else matters. Let's go back to your literal house. You're building a house, and you say, I don't want to spend money on the foundation because we never see it. It's all covered up. And so uh, I know the, the concrete's going to be weak, and it's not mixed well, but I'll do that because I want to focus on spending money on the paint. I want to buy good paint. 
I want to tell you, if the foundation falls, that painting ain't going to mean anything. If we don't have the foundation of the inspiration of the scriptures, nothing else in your house is going to mean a thing if we do not believe in inspiration because every doctrine goes out the window. Here's something else we need to know. The deity of Christ. Thy throne, O God, is forever and forever. The Father said that to the Son. The Father in heaven said to the Son, He called Him God, the deity of Christ. If we don't have this principle that Jesus is divine, that basic principle, then out the window everything else goes. The foundation is not solid. Repentance is a foundation. Acts chapter 17, 30 and 31, God has commanded all men everywhere to repent. If we don't understand the concept of repentance means that I'm ceasing the sin and I'm turning from it in sorrow. God has commanded that of all men, then everything else goes out the window. Here's another principle, and that is divine creation. Let's go to Psalm 33. See, our world has this idea, that, and they mock the idea that there is a divine creator. And not only does the world do that, there are many religious people who mock the idea that there is a divine creator who spoke the world into existence. And let's add to that that there's some of our own brethren who've mocked the idea that God did this instantaneously, that it happened over millions of years, perhaps billions of years. When we buy into the concept that divine creation was not instantaneous and that it took millions of years to settle out, then we have thrown out the basic foundation and our house is going to fall and our house is going to crumble. Let's go to Psalm 33. Psalm 33. The text says in verse, let the earth fear the Lord, let all the habitation of the world stand in all of him, for he spoke it and it was done. He commanded and it stood fast. See, the Lord spoke it and it was done. Instantaneous creation, not millions of years. Here's something else, Bible authority. What does the Bible say about Bible authority? That we must do all things in harmony with the doctrine of Christ. Whosoever goeth onward and abideth not in the doctrine of Christ hath not God. But he who abides in the doctrine of Christ has both the Father and the Son. We must abide within the confines of the doctrine of Jesus Christ. If we don't have that basic principle down, then we'll do anything we want to do in religion. Here's another first principle, the fear of God. Psalm 34. We must learn the fear of God. We must teach the fear of God. And when the fear of God is there, there is obedience. Fearing God, respecting God. Standing in awe of God, being afraid of displeasing Him. And the basic principles of morality. Like Galatians chapter 5, the works of the flesh. He enumerates those, and those who do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. That's just the beginning of list of first principles. That kind of foundation. Building your spiritual house on a solid foundation. Now can you imagine someone building a spiritual house and they don't believe in inspiration? They're not sure that Jesus was divine. They don't understand repentance. They think the world just happened by, by a big bang. Have no respect for Bible authority and morals are gone. What kind of spiritual house will they have? It's going to crumble and it's going to fall. But if you're going to build a house, you've got to have good materials. If you're going to build a house, you must have good materials. I want to tell you, poor quality materials may cause problems down the road. What may seem good at the time, some inferior material, and you're impressed with it at the time, you're especially impressed with the price, may cause problems down the road. They may seem good at the time, but can you imagine building a house with crooked studs? Now, they were discounted. Can you imagine building a house with cracked rafters, cracks all the way through them, doesn't have any strength? Can you imagine building a house with warped plywood? You're going to put that down for your subfloor and it has waves in it, but that's how you're going to build your house. You're building it with inferior materials. I want to suggest you some try to build their spirituality with cheap materials. They try to get by with cheap materials and they don't want good quality materials. Good builders build houses with good materials. Good spiritual builders build their spiritual houses with good materials. Let's talk about some inferior materials in your spiritual house. Some drink from denominational and liberal wells. What do I mean by that? They buy into some of the popular books. I don't mean they believe everything they hear or everything they read or everything they see on a web page. But here's a popular web page among denominations, among some of the more uh, progressive liberal churches of Christ. Some books that are popular. 
And there are Christians who are getting those and they're feeding off of those and they're drinking from tainted wells. You drink from tainted wells, you're going to be tainted. 1 Corinthians 15, warns about association with false teachers. They corrupt your good morals. You're building with inferior material. You say, I'm growing and I'm getting strong. I've been reading this book and I know it's loosened, but I'm really growing. Are you really growing? Your house may have gone up fast. Maybe inferior materials. Some try to build with the fluff that's passed off as Bible preaching. What do we mean by fluff? You ever hear a sermon where it's exciting? There was storytelling. There was jokes that were told. And it's flavored with some scripture. But when you boil it down and you say, let's boil it down and see what we've got. There's no real sustenance to it. There's just nothing there. But it was exciting. He was a great speaker. He kept our attention. All of that fluff. It's like cotton candy. You boil it down. There's nothing there. Some are trying to build their house with spiritual fluff. Some are trying to build on friendships and local church relationships. What I mean, they're converted to the local church. What's really important is the friends they have in that church. It's the relationships they have there. It's not rooted in doctrinal principles. So if this this church just folded, for example, they may not go anywhere because they were wedded to the church. They were wedded to relationships. They built their spiritual house on relationships and to a local church rather than their relationship to the Lord. They're building with inferior materials. Let's talk about good materials, quality materials. We're not to build with uncertain sounds. This was in the context of the speaking in tongues, and if a trumpet issues an uncertain sound, you don't know whether to go to battle or to retreat. You don't know what to do. That's the point of 1 Corinthians 14, 8. And I want to tell you there's some uncertain sounds being issued, even from pulpits among brethren. What do you mean uncertain sound? There's a signal that's going out that that doesn't really ring true to the book, but it's sometimes hard to put your finger on. Don't build with uncertain sounds. Let's build with the Word of God. Whoever I listen to, whoever I read after, whoever I'm listening to, I need to make sure they're preaching the Word of God. 2 Timothy 3, 16, all Scripture is given by inspiration of God. That same message now mentioned there, go just a few verses later, Paul told Timothy, 2 Timothy 4, to preach the word, be instant in sight. What word? That word that's inspired. You make sure they're preaching the inspired word. You build with the word of God, the whole counsel of God. You say, I want to I identify with the church here, and, and I haven't heard any error, but are they preaching the whole counsel? Are they warning about some of the dangers? Are they preaching the truth on this question? Are they preaching the truth on that question? They may not be preaching error, but are they preaching the truth? Are they teaching the truth? Are they preaching the whole counsel of God? Is it balanced preaching? Or is it all first principles? Or is it all with the home? Or is it all dealing with evidences? Or is there some balance in my my diet that I'm getting? I need to build my spiritual house with a balanced diet. I need to build upon a genuine faith. Like 1 Peter 5, 1 and verse 7, that is tested by fire and it comes out pure on the other side. A genuine, a real faith. I need to build with quality materials. I need to build without hypocrisy. God is not mocked, Galatians 6, 7 said. I can't fool God. I can put on a front, front, I can feign, and I can pretend, and I can have this veneer out front, and I can fool everyone else, but I can't fool my God. I'm building a house with inferior materials, with hypocrisy. I need to build without hypocrisy. I need to build with quality materials. You want to build your house? You need to have the right tools. I can't imagine someone saying, I'm going to build a house and fishing to dig a footer. What are you going to dig it with? I don't have any tools. I'm going to frame my house. Well, what, what kind of tool? I don't have any. Oh, I'm going to wire the house. Do you have any wire cutters? No, I don't, I don't have any tools, but I'm going to do it. If you're going to build a house, you have to have the right tools. There's some things you can't do without the right tool. It's hard to drive a nail without a hammer or a nail gun. Try it and see. It's hard to dig a hole without a shovel. It's hard to cut a board without a saw. You've got to have the right tools if you're going to build a house. There's no saying that says you can do anything with the right tool, and that's true. If you've got the right tool, you can do it. Same thing is true spiritually. Some have the right tools, though, but they don't know how to use them. You could put that saw and you could put that hammer and you could put nail gun in someone's hand, but they may not know what they're doing. 
So you can have the right tools and still not know how to use those tools. There's some specialty tools sometimes that maybe only a few have that are really, really helpful. Got to have the right tools. Let's make some spiritual application. Here's some tools we have. We have the Word of God. We have some instruction. We have some guidance. Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 17 talks about the sword of the Spirit. Whatever the Spirit wants to accomplish, whatever the Spirit seeks to do, the Word of God is said to be the sword, the tool that the Spirit uses. So if I need to be built up, the Spirit of God can use this tool to build me up. If I need to be rebuked, the Spirit of God can take this tool and build me up. If I need to be made stronger, I can be made stronger by this tool of the Spirit. That's what Ephesians 6 and verse 17 is saying. We have the tool of the Word of God. Here's another tool we have. We have prayer. Ephesians chapter 6 verse 18. Now that follows on the heel of this sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, taking with you the, the armor. Well, it was, if we list the armor, if this was a Bible class, and I said, let's list the elements of the armor. I think we'd list everything but prayer. But prayer is one of the tools. She's not giving a parallel there. It's one of the tools. And so we have prayer as one of our tools that we take with us as the armor of God. 1 Peter 5 and verse 7, we can cast our cares upon Him. So you say, I'm trying to live the Christian life. I'm trying to build my, my spiritual house, and I wish I had the right tool. Have you used prayer? Have you taken your problems to God and talked to Him about that? Have you asked for strength? Have you asked for wisdom? Have you asked for help? Have you used that tool? Is that a tool you forgot about that's in your toolbox? We have a high priest. I say we have some specialty tools that not everybody has. We, we have a number of people that have different kinds of tools. We have mechanics in the church here and various people who do tools. Farmers have tools that I don't have and mechanics have tools. I have some tools they don't have. We have specialty tools. We have a tool that the world doesn't have. We have access to a high priest. We have a high priest. And by the way, Hebrews chapter 4 is in the context of making your way through the, your, your, your wilderness to your promised land and their struggles and trials and difficulties along the way. How do I deal with that? You come to the throne of grace in time of need. You have a high priest that will help you. He understands. He was tempted in all points like as we. There are elders. Titus 1. Titus 1, if we were just to read that, that chapter, and this were a Bible class, and I said, what's this chapter saying? Somebody would say, it's talking about the qualifications of elders, and you're right. Now the question is, what's the point? And someone says, well, I'll tell you what, that, the point of uh, Titus 1 is that men have to meet these qualifications. Well, that's partly true, too. The point of Titus 1, in the context with the book, is being sound in the faith. And it is saying we have elders to help us build and maintain that sound faith and guard and protect that sound faith. That's a tool you have in your toolbox. Building your spiritual house. Here's another tool. We have brethren. Exhort one another daily while it's called today. We encourage one another. We exhort one another. Hebrews 10 and verse 24. We have tools that help us. Do you know how to use the tools? Now, some people don't know how to use a tool. Building a house. Some people don't know how to use the elder. Some people don't know how to use brethren. They don't know how to use prayer. 2 Timothy 2.15 talks about that you may, may know how to order behave yourself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar in the ground. That's actually 1 Timothy 3.15. Um, 2 Timothy 2.15, Paul said, Be diligent to present yourself approved to God, a workman that does not be, need to be ashamed, rightly handling the word of truth, rightly dividing, or handling a right the word of truth. In other words, Dealing with the tool properly. Here's the word of God. Are you handling it properly? Do you know how to handle that? Do you know how to use the word? James 5 talks about, is any sick among you? Let him call for the elders. Using them as need to be used. Do you know how to use the word? Not everybody knows how to use the word of God. Not everybody knows how to use a hammer. Not everybody knows how to use a shovel. Not everybody knows how to use prayer. Not everybody knows how to use elders. Do you know how to use the tools you have? If you're going to build your spiritual house, you've got to have the right tools. If you've never built a house, this may surprise you, but you've got to be prepared for the cost. If you ever build a house, you've got to be prepared for the cost. Generally, when you start a house, you have an idea, an estimate before you start. 
If you sign a contract, it's going to cost you more, but then you may know exactly what it's going to cost you. But quite often, in fact, most of the time it does, it ends up costing you more than what you thought it was going to cost you. A whole lot more than what you thought. That's just the nature of building a house. Some of the costs are going to surprise you. Maybe the overall cost doesn't surprise you, but here's some particular thing you think, man, I never thought I would ever pay that for that. I didn't dream this would cost me that much. And it just surprised. And other things may surprise you how cheap that is. That's the nature of building. If you're going to have a house, you have to pay. If you want to have brick on your house, you've got to pay the cost. You want to have carpet, you're going to have to pay for the cost of carpet. You want hardwood, that's going to cost a little more, but you've got to, have, you've got to pay for that. There's cost that's involved. Your spiritual house has many costs within it. Are you building your spiritual house? You're trying to get by as cheap as you can? What's it going to cost you? Talk about the cost. Let's go to Luke chapter 14. Verse 28, Jesus said, For which of you intending to build a tower does not sit down first and count the cost, whether he has enough to finish it? So what's the point of that? What Jesus is saying is discipleship is going to cost you. Before you decide and sign up for discipleship, you might want to calculate whether it's going to cost you anything. And it is, are you willing to pay the price? You say, I want to build a house, but I don't want to pay anything. Well, then good luck. Tell me how that turns out. It's going to cost you. Probably more than you think. You say, I want to be a Christian. Well, it's going to cost you. And this passage is telling me it may cost you more than you think. Tell you what it may cost you. It may cost you relationships. I want to tell you, I've bought stuff in building that I never dreamed I'd pay that much for that small piece of something. I I cannot believe I paid that. And you sign up to build your spiritual house and you may come across a cost you thought, I never thought I'd have to pay this to have this spiritual house. Let's go to Matthew chapter 19 in verse 29. This is where Jesus, again, is talking about discipleship. And here's what he said at verse 29. He said, everyone who's left his house and brothers and sisters and father and mother and wife and children and lands for my name's sake shall receive a hundredfold and inherit eternal life. It may cost you family. It may cost your relationship to your children. Some of you've paid that price. It may cost you your relationship to your parents. Some of you have paid that price. It may cost you the relationship of your mate. Some of you have paid that price. See, building a house can be very costly. Very costly. Cost you relationships. Let's go to chapter 10. Same book, chapter 10. Look at verse 35. Matthew chapter 10 and in verse 35. Jesus said, I came to set a man against his father and a daughter against her mother and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. Families sometimes are in disarray. Some are in disarray because of sin. Some are in disarray because somebody in the family decided to live right and nobody else wanted to go along. It may cost you. Some of you have relationships, close relationships, mother, father, brother, sister, where you're not on speaking terms because of your allegiance to Christ. It costs you. It may cost you money. It did Simon. Simon gained money. From his sorcery, and he gave that up to build a spiritual house. Acts 19, those Ephesians, they brought their books and the price of them were 50,000 pieces of silver. They gave up. It cost them money. It may cost you money. You may lose money because of your Christianity. You think building a, a, a physical house costs you money? It may cost you more to build your spiritual house like you never dreamed. It may not only cost you money, it may cost you pleasure. Things that you once enjoyed, you quit. The passing pleasures of sin, Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 25. It may even cost you your life. That's what Revelation 2 is about. Be thou faithful unto death, unto the point of death. It costs Polycarp that. It may cost you a lot. There may be some cost you hadn't counted on. If you've ever built a house... And I can tell you by experience, you get to something, you say, I, I, didn't, I didn't think about that expense. <laughs> I knew it was going to cost us here and there and there, but I didn't count. I, didn't, I wasn't even calculating it that this was going to cost us. 
Wow. I want to tell you, living the Christian life and building your spiritual life is going to be the same way. That you, I knew it was going to cost me this and this, but I never dreamed. It's going, this was a, cow, a cost I didn't count on. I didn't count on that. It's going to cost you. Finally, you want to build your spiritual house, I want to tell you, it's going to take time. Just like it does with a physical house, it takes time. It'll take you longer than you want it to. Quality and workmanship takes time. Can't rush that. Quick and fast is not always good. Hired a concrete man to come and do some work for me, and he took him some time, but he did a great job. I didn't want fast. Hired a tile man. He's one of the slowest I've ever seen, but he did a great job. Outstanding job. See, quality takes time. It takes longer than you ever dreamed. You thought you'd be finished a long time ago. You never seem to ever get finished. You get frustrated. I don't believe I'm ever going to get to the end. I don't believe I'm going to make it. And I want to tell you that there are some who attempt to build a spiritual house and they want it overnight. They want it quick. They want to suddenly be strong. I want to start with the second and I'll come back to the first. Some get discouraged because they're not what others are. What do I mean by that? Here's someone who's young in the faith or they're weak in the faith. And they look to someone stronger and they want tomorrow to be as strong as they are. Look at brother so-and-so. He's he's influential. Look at sister so-and-so. She knows her Bible. She wields a lot of influence on others. People are going to her for advice and encouragement. And I want to be that. And I want to be that by tomorrow. It's going to take time. Can't do that. Look at Matthew chapter 13 in the parable of the sower. I want to say, suggest to you that some quick growth doesn't last. This is where, where seed fell among the stones and it sprung up. It grows, but it died out. Some quick growth doesn't last. And you say, I want to build a physical house and I want it quick. So they throw it up fast, but it may not last. I want a tile man and he throws it on, but it may not look good. I want my concrete done. And I want it done now. And he throws it up and it falls. See, it takes time. Let's go to Hebrews chapter 11. For when the time, you ought to be teachers. Some time had passed since these people had obeyed the gospel. If my understanding be correct, that was probably the church at Jerusalem to which he writes. If that be the case, some time has passed. Some years have passed. And they should have grown and developed. It should have taken time. And they didn't use that time properly. It's what I'm learning is it takes some time. It takes some time for workable knowledge. So I want to have your knowledge. I want to have this person's knowledge and that person's knowledge. They didn't get that overnight. It takes time. Quality knowledge takes time. It takes time for spiritual maturity. You see, the one who is weak today is not going to be mature tomorrow. They can be forgiven immediately, but they're not going to be strong tomorrow. It takes time. It takes time. It takes time to be strong. It takes time to be a good teacher. It takes time to have a strong marriage. Say, I want a great marriage. It's going to take some time. It takes time to overcome temptation. And like building a house, you never get completed and you get finished. 2 Peter 3.18, but grow in the grace and in the knowledge so what does that have to do with anything? That's written to me, to you, and to the person who is weak, and the person that's strong, and the person that's mature. We're to keep growing. You never get through. And in building a physical house, there may be th- things that you never get done, that you intended to get done. That spot that you were going to touch up when we got, finally got around to the end of it may never have gotten touched up, and it's been 20 years. You never got to it. I was going to do this over here when I got through with the rest, but I never got to that. You never get through. And in building your spiritual house, you never come to the completion where you say, I'm done, I'm finished, it's over. You're still building. You're still building. You're still growing. Building your spiritual house. What about building your spiritual house? Well, you've got to have a plan. You've got to know what you're building. Need to know how to build. Need to build on the right foundation. Got to have good materials. Got to have the right tools and know how to use those tools. Need to be prepared for the cost. It's going to cost you dearly. 
It's going to take time. That's the nature of building. How's your spiritual house coming? How's it coming? You doing well with your spiritual house? Have you neglected? Have you forgotten it? Is it coming along strong? Or have you set it aside and you've been neglecting that? How's your spiritual house? There may be one more present who's not a Christian, who's not a child of God. Would you come this morning believing that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God? Would you repent of your sins, acknowledge your faith, and be buried in the waters of baptism for the remission of sins? If you're subject in any way, would you come while together we stand and sing?